Greetings, building science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by April Air, the trusted leader in indoor quality solutions. Through their understanding of consumer needs for indoor air quality and HVAC channel expertise, they help home builders leverage the full value and benefits of healthy home solutions. They provide multiple products for variable applications and budgets while meeting consumer and builder demand for indoor air quality improvement. And we've incorporated April Air products into our designs for years because they provide real value for engineer systems. For their full product line, check out aprilair.com backslash BSP. That's air with an E. Whatever your favorite way to access the internet besides this podcast, aprilair.com is the first step towards a healthier home. Now sit back, relax, open your mind, and enjoy the rest of the episode. Welcome to this. Okay. Uh, welcome to the building science. To the building science podcast. 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 Welcome to the building science podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. Ready, Miguel? It's on. It's rolling. It's rolling. Okay. Hello, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm. Christoph Irwin here, as always, with my trusty sidekick, Miguel. Hey, guys. New York's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we are here in New York, as you just heard, at the AIA, the American Institute of Architects Convention, AIA 2018. We're here with two members of the COAT Advisory Committee, Corey Squire with Lake Plato Architects and T- Tate Walker with OPN Architects. Let's start with quick introductions. Corey, let's start with you. Please introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Corey Squire. I'm the Sustainability Manager at Lake Plate Architects, and as Christoph just said, um, a new member of the COAT National Advisory Group. Congratulations, Corey. Thank you. And Tate? Um, I'm Tate Walker. I'm with uh, OPN Architects out of Madison, Wisconsin. We're about 120 people in Iowa and Wisconsin, and uh, I'm the Director of Sustainable Design Architect, so doing both. Fantastic, and fantastic that there's that your firms have directors of sustainability, right? <laughs> yes. Sustainability offices, that's fantastic. So we're here today to talk with you guys about some of the work that you've been doing with something that's called the COAT Toolkit. But first, let's talk about COAT. So COAT is C-O-T-E, Committee on the Environment. Could one of you please describe just an introduction or make some comments about what is COAT? Sure. So COAT is actually about 25 years old, maybe a little bit older now, but um, it's really kind of uh, based around the COAT top 10 measures of sustainable design, and it's the longest running design award for sustainability in the industry, in the world. Wow. So yeah, it's pretty special. It's evolved a lot over time, um, and just recently overhauled. So it's kind of our hallmark program, but we do a lot around advocacy. Uh, we've got this amazing toolkit. Uh, we had 800 firms sign a letter to, uh, to petition DOE and EPA uh, to save a bunch of their environmental programs that support the practice of architecture, All like right. Target Finder and Portfolio Manager. Uh, so we are really the sort of voice of sustainability within the Institute and help draw all these programs together. So mindful materials, diversity in architecture, uh, oh, right. resilience. I didn't know that. And yeah, it's, it's kind of the umbrella. Yeah, we do it all. <laughs> and, um, and as Tate said, kind of, um, we are a bit of a lobbying organization or advocacy. We, um, I, most recently we had this effort, um, we sent a letter to FEMA in, to encourage them to keep the phrase climate change in their official doctrine. Oh, I saw that. that was cool. And that was signed by a whole bunch of firms. A lot of exciting, positive feedback from that effort. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're pushing for these ideas. That's fantastic. It, isn't there some connection to the, the dawn of USGBC and the Code Committee? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, so Code predated USGBC by a few years, and a lot of those early efforts kind of went to um, help structure the USGBC and how it worked. And a 
lot of the same members kind of supported both organizations, and we still do to this day. Yeah, it's so important. And just a personal note, both Miguel and I are members of the Code Committee in Austin, and it's fantastic work. And so you guys listening, there's probably a Code Committee near you. If not, you know, the internet exists. You can interact digitally. <laughs> and and most cities have or a Code chapter, yeah, and there's, there's more and more popping up all the time. So yeah. San Antonio, uh, where I'm from, we have a fairly um, fairly prominent committee. Yeah, it's thriving. Our, our coat has been around for about 20 years as well, probably as long as the national one. Um, almost everybody in the city has been a coat chair at some point. Or, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going strong, and we hope that a lot of other cities are kind of doing their own thing. There's a lot of exciting opportunities at the local le- level to kind of shape the committee for the priorities that are necessary for, for the local community of architects. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. I mean, these these kind of these inner scaffolding, this the inner structure of, a, of an organization creates the backbone such that activity can occur, virtuous activity or aspirational activity, you know, and that's what this is. Coates has a new toolkit that you guys have been developing. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know it's, exactly what it it's is. It's a can resource. You the it's toolkit? called the toolkit. <laughs> <laughs> the Code Top 10 toolkit is a new resource that the Committee on the Environment is putting out. Um, it's going to be out nationally, and we've just launched Phase 1, which is kind of a meta-analysis of a lot of great resources and a lot of great strategies that exist out there for high-performing projects. Okay. And just before we get too much, we're obviously going to talk about the toolkit, but you mentioned, Tate, that the Coat Top 10 had recently been overhauled. Yeah. Is that related to the toolkit? How does that? How does the Coat Top 10 and the toolkit Right. So um, for years and years, the Top 10 was a criteria for an award. Okay. Right? And so what would happen is you'd design your building, you'd wait a year, you'd gather, collect all this occupancy data, and so it's a... It's, it's a board with some teeth. Yeah. Yeah, which is strange for architects, but important, awesome. right? It's about beauty, it's about design, but it's also about performance. And nobody else does that. If you want performance, USGBC will do that. Um, if you want design, AIA will do that. Only Coke does both. And so, recently with this overhaul, the teeth became a little teethier. Yeah. Where in, the, in the past, we asked for metrics on water and metrics on energy, but the list of metrics really increased to cover the broad range of sustainable topics with the most recent overhaul. So starting two years ago, the new criteria was launched. Um, it's still 10 measures of sustainable design as it always been, but now we're asking for specific metrics uh, connected with materials, with health, um, with daylighting, with uh, community, and one complication that this added was um, the submission process became more technical, mm. which might have created a need for a toolkit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's the connection between the Code Top 10 and the toolkit. Yeah. So, but just to kind of play off what you were saying there, Corey, um, we took this award criteria that came at the end of the process and flipped it to the beginning, right? So it's helping to inform design projects in their conceptual phases. And these questions that the measures pose are design questions, right? So they they sort of, they're open-ended, yeah. and they're um, used to kind of further a dialogue with the client early on in the process as opposed to at the end. Mm-hmm. So that was the big change and what the toolkits there to help people. And another difference is, I mean, the, the awards program has been around for 25 years, but the framework is a really powerful tool for designing a really high-performing building. And then kind of along the lines of what Tate was saying is... We almost didn't see the, the opportunity that the framework existed as a design resource until until recently. So um, we're hoping that this toolkit will make that connection, encourage people to start taking a look at measures, taking a look at metrics from the beginning of the design process, analyzing, improving as they go, and not just calculating a whole bunch of things at the end of the project, seeing how they're doing, submitting it, mm-hmm. and then maybe or maybe not winning, and <laughs> never thinking about it again. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a process, and, it's, uh, and it might lead to an award, or it might just lead to a lot of really high-performing buildings that yeah. we can be really proud of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's the manifestation of the idea of begin with the end in mind, and also sample <laughs> all the way through. I mean, yeah. If you're making a meal, you don't just 
often you don't just cook the whole thing and then wonder what it tastes like. <laughs> I, did that, yeah. I did that once with yeah. pasta, and it was the worst pasta. I was so <laughs> oversalted. I learned my lesson. Okay, so the we don't want our is... buildings to be oversalted. Yeah, don't <laughs> oversalt your buildings. <laughs> Oversimplification to say that the toolkit is a is a support system to help people achieve the uh, goals of the top ten awards or something. Well, I think sustainability is just incredibly broad. Oh, you know, we should dig into that, man. Right? How do you start? <laughs> and that Corey and I were talking. The biggest barrier to incorporating sustainability is time. Right in a professional's life. You've got a, a million things you need to deliver on mm-hmm. budget, on mm-hmm. schedule. You know, sustainability is often left out, not because people don't care about it, but because there's just not enough time to squeeze it in. Here, here. Yeah. So it's really just to help make that more time that you do have more efficient and, and push you further than you ordinarily would. Have. Yeah. And it's almost like sustainability is is an optional version of like ADA or fire code. So these are what? requirements. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, these are these are requirements. They made the buildings more complicated. Fire code and ADA made buildings oh, better, yeah. um, it, but they were additional complicated things that you mm-hmm. had to incorporate into an already complicated design process under the same budget and the same schedule. The difference is that sustainability, which now is important, we try to incorporate it in, is not mandated by the other ones. It's not as, as clear as, let's say, life a, safety. Life safety. Yeah. It's not as clear as a proportion for a stairwell or, or a ramp. Um, so that's almost what we're doing. If you could take some some standard features of sustainability and, and, and yeah. just outline them in a toolkit, and mm-hmm. it's as easy as looking at a life safety manual or the AIA or ADA or any other codes. Um, now, we don't want to sound like code. We don't want it to be kind of... Um, uh, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be claustrophobic, right? You don't want to be top down. It's, it's. Um, no shall, no must. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. It's um, as Tate was saying. We don't need to reinvent the wheel on sustainability every time. There's a lot of things that work on every project, and if they're just accessible while you're designing, you incorporate them and then move on to the next. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's one thing that's really unique about the cold kit toolkit development process, which was the, if you need to do one thing. Yes. So hopefully we talk about that at, at some point, but it's like, it's kind of the, the canon, if you will, of sustainability. So for energy, you do one thing, you must do, well, maybe three things. Right? Let's take a look. We might as well. <laughs> like benchmark, you need to do an energy model, and you need to do uh, some measurement and verification if you want to deliver super sustainable hey oh yeah I, I need to do those things mm-hmm. uh, and each of the ten measures has those things so for any measure let's say designed for water for instance there might be 20 best practices that are listed in this tool guide but there might be three things that are listed right at the beginning under if I can only do one thing they're incredibly effective they're accessible they're in theory not difficult or expensive and if you touch upon them your project's going to be improved okay good so we're about to go into the measures and before we do that I want to uh, the question came up for me because you mentioned the client you mentioned the word client <laughs> and so ultimately the client yeah. has to get buy-in and so there needs to be some sort of um, I almost feel like the toolkit needs an introduction. Oh, I see the word introduction. He has the toolkit it open in front of me here. The introduction yeah. is about four the, pages. But something is like, um, <laughs> um, like um, motivational sentences to use with the client, or you know, persuasive language, or something. Uh, could I okay. touch on this? One? Yeah. How do you, I mean? How do you? How do you get the client to say, "Oh, I like this this idea. I like this resource. Let's use a toolkit." Well, there's a really great article recently in Building Green. Did you guys? Oh yeah. That love rag. That. Love it's it. pretty good. Um, Subscriber forever. Yeah, it's it's talking about the unicorn client. You know, the client. We'll never... put a link to that in the show notes. Okay, okay. unicorn client. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the client doesn't come to you saying, you know, what's the most bleeding edge sustainability things we could do on this project. You know, those clients generally don't exist, um, or they're very rare, or they have no money to right. do these things. Right, they have the aspiration, <laughs> but no money. You need the Venn diagram with both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what can you do every time? What can you do with a client that's more reserved? Uh, yeah. What can you do with a client that's on the bubble? 
basically hiring you for your expertise and we need to give you the tools to make sure that you're pushing them as far as they're willing to go. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So, so in some, some ways you could uh, uh, just go there as, as the architect. Yeah. Like, they hired us, you know, they hired, like, Plato, they hired OPN, and you guys say, oh, yeah, yeah, we have the 10... Top ten. I'm sorry. That's coat ten factors in our design. Top ten measures of sustainable design. Yeah, yeah. It is. top ten measures of sustainable design are implicit in what you're doing. They don't ask you for like a bad design. <laughs> Similarly, they don't ask you for like a low performing building, right? Yeah. So how can you really kind of push that? Yeah, yeah. But there's this idea in the industry that we always have to ask the client if like, can we please make your building more high performing? Oh, permissive. For, right, yeah. right. And you don't really need to like. A Tate said, nobody's asking for a low-performing building. They want a great building. Yeah. They want to be comfortable. They want to be healthy. They want to have great daylighting. Um, they don't want to pay high-energy bills. Well, the, the, the tricky part there is, uh, you know, the low first cost and, you know, what, what the trades are ready to do. There's a, there is a little dance there. Well, low first cost is an issue in all projects. Yeah. Um, but there's very little evidence that I've seen. Mm -hmm that there's a really strong correlation between a high-performing building and a high-first cost. Well said. So that I'd seems like to, to be a that. myth. In fact, when people have more money, they tend to spend it on frivolous things, not high-performing systems. Yeah, like marble countertops. Like marble countertops. Yeah. More expensive buildings are more likely to have marble countertops, but not more likely to have really, really great wall assemblies. Well said, well said. And, and this would be a good point. There, there are a number of great resources in Design for Economy, which is one of the measures, yes. right? Um, just what you need to do to push that ROI. Awesome. Right? But another piece about talking to clients and using the toolkit yeah. as a tool to talk to clients is it can almost be seen as a menu of strategies to accomplish some goals. So a lot of times sustainability goals might be a number. 25% reduction in energy use, 16% reduction in indoor water use. But there's no clear manifestation, yeah. and there's no clear idea of what that looks like, how it is incorporated, but the either uh, best practices or some rules of thumb or just some strategies that can accomplish these make um, the, the concepts more uh, manifest, right. something you can actually talk about. It's so I, important. Yeah, I think... Those were great sort of technical examples of how the toolkit works, but there's also this beauty component that we had a hard time talking about and unpacking. But when it comes down to it, like a beautiful place to work, uh, to live, um, a building is the number one predictor of happiness, right? And that's the most important thing. This is a design award too, and uh, it's really easy to come up with all the papers on technical things. There's no universal definition of beauty. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> is it, at least is it since, subjective? Uh, at least since Vitruvius, you know. Right. There, it's questionable whether it's subjective or not. Other things like well-being is much more objective, but still very, very difficult to quantify. Yes. And subjective, yeah. And it could be subjective. Yeah, because it's different. All right, so I think uh, we've talked about it enough, uh, talked about the outside of it. Let's talk about the inside of it. So there's 10 measures or 10 tools? What are they? 10 what? 10 measures. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I don't know that the episode's going to be long enough to dig into each one. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, Can you one. do an overview and we'll go through a few? We can read off the 10 measures and you can choose the ones that we want to go into. How Let's that? do that. Okay. We have design for integration, design for community, design for ecology, design for water, design for economy, design for energy, design for wellness, design for resources, design for change, and design for discovery. And a big piece of this toolkit is that all of these measures are on an even playing field. So designing for change, which could be resilience, could be loose fit, could be adaptability, is just as important as design for energy. And historically, energy has had this prominence, and probably just because it's more measurable, it's easier to talk about. But all these things are incredibly important. Wow. Okay, so I got nine. What are you missing? Um, well, well, I'm the first one, I can't read my handwriting. Integration. Only. Integration. Oh, that's a great one. So integration, community, 
ecology, water, economy, wellness, resources, change, discovery. And missed energy. Oh my goodness. How is that? <laughs> Where was that one? Right in the middle. Right in the middle. That's because if you get the, all, the, all the others right, energy just, just, just it's be just assumed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and I do feel like energy has um, gotten a disproportionate share. I mean, you know, yeah. there's obvious reasons for that, but uh, it's an important one to push on. Wow. So that's it. All you have to do is those 10 things, and you have the most sustainable building you can possibly Ever. Yeah, yeah. It's perfect. You're set. <laughs> I mean, truly, it, it, this is really impressive. It's but really if nothing else, in all honesty, do one thing to improve your project on these 10 measures, and the toolkit gives you a whole bunch of options on how to do that. Yeah. And we'll get some really great projects with minimal effort, minimal cost, and great outcomes. So start with design for integration. Is there a few key ideas you could share on that? Yeah, this is where you, this is the only place where you can talk about design as an element, mm -hmm. about beauty, right? What's the big idea? That, that's the key point. And uh, you know, so so many times with sustainability, we get this laundry list of ECMs or energy conservation measures, or mm -hmm. you know, moves that we did for water, storm water, and it, it lacks the gravitas yeah. that, that that big idea needs to have for the project to be like incredibly powerful and mm -hmm. emotional. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important, a concept that I like to think about is a sustainable project or a high performing project is not a regular project with some sustainability features. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the laundry list. That's how it's always been thought about in the past. It has to be integrated. It has to be... Um, the, the strategies need to be manifest in the form of the building, the function of the building. It needs to perform well from every aspect. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's this, this is such a key requirement in the sense that this um, perceived tension, like, almost like polar opposites between a functional building and a beautiful building, right? And you know, the, no. the human body is both functional and elegant. You know. You don't have to choose. Yeah, yeah you, you don't just, have to choose. It's both. Right. It has to be both. And we did some research recently. Uh, there's a great paper out there called The Habits for High Performing Firms. And we found that like eight out of the ten firms that have won multiple code awards over the years were actually the firm of the year at the AIA. Interesting. So that it, it says to me that Sustainability has to be a component in the design if it's to be considered good architecture, and it's not. They're not separated at all. It's not That's a niche market. It's, yeah. it's, it's such an important idea. idea. You can't. Maybe you can't even win the firm award without a strong sustainability aspect. Because if sustainability is great design, you can't have great design without it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so, mm, please go ahead, Dave. Oh, yeah. Um, I was just going to add quickly, it's really pushing the boundaries of what the AIA considers as like measures of great design, too. They're starting to ask these questions of the honor awards, right? The best architecture that's being created every year. So they've they've gone way beyond this like fringe coat thing and, and made their way like deep into the organization as a whole. That's so great, and that does reflect I think the deep aspirations of our society is to is to do this. But getting back into beauty, you just touched on you. Know, oh, sorry. How do we, no, I like it. Is integration about the integration of the form and the function? Is that? I mean, I mean what yeah, is the shape? Fundamentally, the shape of green. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a great book by Lance Hosey. Yeah. Um, you know, they, uh, it's so hard to talk about in any other sort of venue than academia. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Um, and, and I think it's really critical to how we experience place and uh, how people, it's part of their um, DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's where I was going to get to. Is, is, is there something... Uh, implicitly arising out of being human, you know, like like biophilia, and yeah. th that you could almost uh, design toward it. You just know, but but I really think the best architects do something that's like almost ineffable. They kind of reach into their soul and they they pull out this design. I don't know what causes that, except humans are amazing. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to quantify. Yeah, right. Absolutely, <laughs> and that's the problem we had writing this section. Yeah. Um, but yeah. this doesn't make the section any less important. There, there's the nothing in this section like how to have a deep insight or deep inspiration. <laughs> how to design a step-by-step guide to a beautiful building. No, we don't offer that. 
Right, I think we got we got integration pretty well. Community, let's switch gears. We're gonna to go to community now, number two. This so, is so much fun. I mean, this is one of my favorite measures. This is one of my favorite measures as well. I found out so much going through the process with you, Corey, on this one. I mean, there, there were so many good resources out there that I just had no idea existed. Yeah. It's incredibly powerful to think outside the context of a building. So there's this idea of where do we draw the boundary of sustainability? Is it at the envelope? Is it at the site? Or is it at everything that impacts uh, the people who are coming and going? What we learned by studying this um, this measure from a really objective carbon perspective, if nothing else, is that commuting uses almost as much carbon, depending on the context, as building operations. Wow. So if we want to work on carbon reduction, we need to talk about how people are getting to the site, where the site is, um, as, as, as much as we're talking about... Uh, operations, yeah. just emissions. Can I ask, why do you care about carbon, Corey? Why do I personally care about yeah. carbon? Because <laughs> you're made of it? I am made of it, that's true. <laughs> I'm getting back to the basics here. Let's get Sorry. back to basics. <laughs> I like it. Carbon emitted into the atmosphere leads to global warming, which is a major problem that our society or civilization faces. Yeah. And a large percentage of that carbon that's emitted is the result of buildings, their operations, transportation to and from them, and the embodied carbon that goes into the material and construction processes. Yeah. Um, we've learned this from Architecture 2030 that, um, I forgot the exact stats, but it's like 60%. 60% of all carbons, all carbon emissions in the atmosphere, have some correlation with buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the other thing I've learned from being on the technical review team is architects don't really have a good handle on how to calculate carbon impacts. It's yeah, it's not very straightforward. Um, the toolkit will make it straightforward. Yeah. Though. So <laughs> along these same lines, let's introduce the super spreadsheet. Okay. Oh, the so, super spreadsheet. <laughs> da -da -da. Along the uh, the toolkit is actually. And we'll get back to community in a minute, I guess. All right. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's good. The, the toolkit has multiple um, multiple components. And what we've been talking about so far is the best practice design guide, which is what's available to download from the website right now uh, we'll definitely in a phase a one to format. That. But that's only a small piece of what the whole toolkit will end up being. Oh, really? Yes. Part of this is going to be... Um, a resource guide on the COAT website with links to all the best resources from our meta-analysis. There's going to be a eventually a searchable database of previous COAT winners and case studies on them so you can study these strategies as they are incorporated into real buildings and real beautiful buildings that have either won COAT awards or are just great buildings Love all it. around. Lead by example. And the last piece is what we're calling the super spreadsheet which is a, right now, when, it, when it's launched, um, it'll be a downloadable Excel document that will allow you to punch simple metrics from your projects across all these design measures, and it'll auto-calculate a lot of the metrics for you. So you don't need to have a background in energy modeling, you don't need to have a background in benchmarking to be able to get a pretty good idea of where your project stands and where it can be improved. And as Tate was saying, not so carbon great. is something that's incredibly complicated for architects to get their head around. So just with a few measures, a few metrics that, that we should all know, square footage, um, energy use, either predicted or actual, um, this spreadsheet will calculate the carbon produced by emissions, the carbon produced by embodied energy, and the carbon produced by... Uh, Transportation. 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 I wondered. Awesome. That's great. We do that over a kind of a first year time frame when the, the building is going to be a major component and then over the lifetime of the building when the operations and the commuting carbon kind of takes over. Yeah. Just sort of a light touch on it. Are, where are you drawing the data from for the embodied energy piece? Is the embodied energy point? is, there's a few different resources you can use. We have a link in the toolkit and also in the spreadsheet to simple web calculators that allow you to punch in some, some information on your building and it'll generate cool. carbon, um, carbon divided energy. There's also more complicated tools for a more fine-tuned analysis and we have some links to those and some explanations about how to use those as well. Great. So it's at the level that They're you're so at great. and the amount of effort that you can yeah. spend on it um, will either get, just with a few clicks, you'll get somewhere within 15% <laughs> or with a few hours you can 
really, really zero in. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of listeners who are very interested in body energy, so that's why I asked to make sure they know. How do you know uh, your carbon calculation is within the bounds of reality? So another great piece of the spreadsheet <laughs> is that we we list reasonable ranges for every building type for every measure. If you punch in some numbers, you can then compare that number to what you'd expect the building to be, either a very high-performing building or a very baseline building. And if your numbers are completely out of whack, you know something is wrong. Yeah, mm-hmm. ask some questions. Yeah, Which is so questions. important. Let's dig in a little deeper. Yeah. Um, and what we found in the past is if you don't have that framework to work within, you might not be able to interpret your results, and you have no idea if it's in the realm of reality or multiple orders of magnitude removed. <laughs> yeah, so. I love it. So I just want to, we should wrap up carbon. I'm so glad okay. you brought it up. But just to help people with like a, almost like a visceral explanation of carbon, I hope we start to understand now what, what's well known that carbon is uh, retroactive. I mean, it's kind of like uh, it's going to take a long time for the carbon that's already in the atmosphere to change. And I use the metaphor, I do a lot of driving, unfortunately. And if you're, like, let's say you're at highway speed going 65 miles an hour and you're coming into a small town, the speed limit is 25, and you know there's a cop. There's an immutable <laughs> cop. You cannot talk him out of it if you're not going 25. So you got to take your foot off the accelerator way early, you know? So it's the same thing here. We have our foot on the accelerator of carbon emission as a society, and there is an immutable, you know, cop out there. Yeah. We really got to think now about okay, I got to slow down now, so I mean, my kids and their kids, yeah. Yeah, a lot of rating systems are reorganizing themselves around carbon. Yeah. Right. So there's the carbon overlay tool at the USGBC. Um, the California is instituting cap and trade. Yeah. Architects need to be up on this so they can quantify the impact that they have yeah. at the table. Yeah. Which is so important. It and is. This is something the tool, uh, not the toolkit, the, the Code Captain Framework did a few years ago when it was reorganized because there's this new emphasis on carbon, um, which didn't exist in the last one. And I think one other piece that's incredibly important about carbon is that energy is often seen as a culprit. We want to decrease energy use. But we really don't want to decrease energy use. Energy is a good thing. We want energy. Energy keeps us comfortable. Energy allows us to do really, really amazing things. Carbon is the problem. We want that energy to be clean. Yeah, beautiful. Very well said. Yeah. Okay, so back to community. Was there any more you want to touch on with community? Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah, I think the big problem with community is... um, how do you engage them in a way that empowers them without losing your shorts? And <laughs> you got to get in there, read the chapter, read the resources to really understand how you can do that effectively as an architect and make better buildings that people will embrace and call their own and, and take care of over time. Well the, said. The last piece we touch upon here is social equity, which is another emerging trend in architecture which has fallen in the purview of sustainability for great reasons, because sustainability um, just really covers the human condition, mm-hmm. and we want to make sure that everybody benefits from what we're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, there's a standard that's using the term fair share of the atmosphere when it talks about carbon and, and yeah. social Fair language. share of the atmosphere. Well, since <laughs> I've been using this on projects, a lot of, you know, Owner-operators really understand community, like the cities, uh, the counties, the governments that I work with, but I've been really surprised that the developer set, asking them these questions about community has really opened up their eyes as to what impacts their projects have as well. So it's been a really powerful tool for me. Okay, so let's let's dig into number three, ecology. So ecology is a really special measure because it's the only measure that doesn't deal with the human condition. It really focuses on the ecosystem and what was there without the human impact. Mm. The areas that we go into here are dark skies, um, mm. making that natural condition, bird-friendly yeah. design. Huge numbers of birds are killed every year by striking into buildings, and there are strategies to avoid that. Fantastic. Site acoustics, how can you keep a site quiet to what this does benefit humans, but also really to benefit local animals, ecosystem. And then habitat and biodiversity we've covered here. How do you create a site that's not ecologically dead, but mm. contributes to the local ecosystem? Wow. Wow, that's impressive, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm amazed that there's ways that that could be pulled off. 
read the toolkit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Anything you want to add to that, Tate? Oh, yeah, the best example of um, a rich ecology is the High Line just down the street. Oh, right my God, it's unbelievable. York, right? Yes. It was not there a few years ago, but it was as if New York had never been developed, right? What are the natural systems? It really gives us a connection to our past. And, and yeah, the native really. plants that are what there. What I noticed on the High Line, which I haven't seen anywhere else in the city, is butterflies. Yeah. There's butterflies in the High Line. <laughs> yeah, if the High Line didn't exist, those butterflies wouldn't be here. Yeah, the Holland Tunnel is no place There's for butterflies. no butterflies in the Holland Tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Water. Water is number four on my list. Yeah, so, um, so many innovations around water right now that use of gray water, black water in projects, and South Africa's water crisis, it's you know, the, it's, the next it's big tragic, thing I think, you know, we, don't, we see water in terms of you know, impact on resilience and change later on um, but basically what you gotta do is calculate your water efficiency every time just the one thing, just do that please, yeah. for me <laughs> do that. Do it for Tate. Yeah. yeah and and so, what does that mean? Water efficiency. You're not going too deep into the well. Oh, good pun. <laughs> but what does that mean? Water efficiency. Well, so we choose uh, the best tool out there, which is like the EPA water sense calculator. Water right? sense. Okay. And it, it looks at the whole building energy use water um, as in relationship to its occupants, right? And. Uh, it gives you a baseline and allows you to calculate efficiency over that. If you're not even trying, you should be able to hit 20%, right? And a really, really high performance building, I don't know, 30%, 40%. Probably 40%, 50% is the max for indoor water use. Yeah. But the other thing that we look at here is outdoor water use. There's a huge amount of water used outdoors. Some of it necessary. For beauty. Some of it, some of it for beauty, which is very important, and some of it for non-beauty. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually a funny inverse relationship between ah. lawns, which are not very beautiful and use a huge amount or of water, biodiverse. and yeah. non-biodiverse and don't form habitat, and native plantings, which are evolved to ah. the water conditions of their location. And you do need some water for establishment, typically, okay. but after that, you can skate along without them. Mm -hmm. So, but. So you, you mentioned 20% to 40%, these ranges. Percent of what? Like there's a baseline and you're this much better than the baseline? Or? Correct. And yeah. Let's talk about benchmarking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted. And, and so is it, yeah, where do the benchmarks come from? Every project starts with a benchmark, right? You got to ask the question first, like what do buildings of this type use? Yeah, yeah. And then you might need to tweak that answer based on, you know, uh, process cooling that you have or... Mm. Mm -hmm. a, a really intense occupant load. Uh, but if you don't ask the question, you have no, no sense of where you fall on that spectrum. Yeah. And so that's it's getting people to ask the question first. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Otherwise, it's just a number. So it's 20% better than the benchmark. The benchmark, which is specific to your building, which has to be determined at the beginning of the design process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, there, and you have resources listed for people to establish those. We questions. have resources. Uh huh. There's calculators. That and are and free. The, the super yeah, spreadsheet. Open source. Yeah. Does the super spreadsheet establish like automatically a, 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 a basic benchmark or a target benchmark or no? It, yeah, it does. Okay. Good. Yeah, there's um, the super spreadsheet has a. I mean, along with the reasonable ranges, the super spreadsheet is a great benchmarking tool. It'll help you benchmark energy, water. It'll help you benchmark. A commute. If you want, if if you have an office building per se, it mm. will give you a number for what a typical office building of that size uses for or emits in terms of their carbon. Yeah. Wow. And you can then see how efficient your building is compared to that. This super spreadsheet sounds awesome. You must, <laughs> you must have had a think tank think tank come up with the name. The super spreadsheet was. <laughs> Superman logo was developed by uh, a very intelligent architect out of San Antonio, Elena Zambrano, yeah. and um, I'm sure she'll have some comments at some point. <laughs> yeah, we can do a follow-up episode. Okay, so number four, moving on from water, number four, uh, number five is economy. So what does the toolkit say about economy? How does it help folks with that? Is this the first cost aspect? Oh, yeah. It goes way deeper than that. Okay, great. Um, so anybody can do a super 
efficient building for seven, eight hundred bucks a square foot, right? It takes a real genius to do it for 150, 250. Well said. And so, how how do you prioritize like that? Um, how I think everybody's familiar with like. Uh, a really stripped down life cycle costs right. like a simple payback right yeah but what are other factors you should be including in that right and what does your client care about right is it uh, is it first cost is it a developer is it operational cost yeah is it a library right so you can cut off 40k a year in operational cost that's an FTE you can put towards programming and you can't uh fundraise around operational costs. You can, but you can fundraise around programming. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you got to do it now. Yeah. And this is how to do it. Can you, can you just define briefly FTE before you... I, I may oh, cut you off. full-time employee. There you go. That's right. right <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And I think that we want to see space as a resource the same way we see water and energy as being a resource. Um, and it's something to conserve. Yeah. So if you decrease space, if you're more efficient in the space of your building... You're saving resources, which save about the carbon. You're heating and cooling less. Um, you're probably putting more thought into the arrangement and possibly getting a better outcome. Yeah. Because it's a little bit more difficult to design a, a more efficient building. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so it's fantastic. That was number... Five economy and the one that I uh, embarrassed to say I didn't hear when you said the first time number six is energy. Oh sure. So talk about design for energy. Well, um, where to start? I mean, there are entire <laughs> like professional careers, careers around <laughs> subsections of energy, yes. right? And and that's yeah. That's, we run into serious problems writing about this, yeah. right? Um, so we took what the, not to write about is as hard as what to write about. Yeah. Exactly. And, and we've got yeah. a pretty good, broad understanding of this um, from the projects that we worked on. But I think what we tried to do for Design for Energy was focus on those systems under the purview of the architect. So what is the skin doing for you? What are the passive systems doing for you? Here, here. So, yeah, that, that's really what makes the difference from a regular design and one that reflects the context of the space it's in yeah. and lends a code of work. So we really wanted to highlight those aspects. The smart uh, submissions do that yeah. in a really, really visible way. And we talk about energy modeling as a great tool for understanding where your building is, knowing where your improvements are to be made. But we also understand that not every project is going to have the budget or the scale or the expertise to do an energy model. And there's some proxies that you can use for just kind of understanding how your building is going to perform. Um, two examples of this are window-wall ratio. Um, the same building with 80% windows is going to use more energy than the building with 40% windows or 30% windows. Mm -hmm. Lighting power density is another example. A building with a lower lighting power density is going to use less energy than a building with a higher lighting power density. So even if you don't have the resources to run a full-blown energy model, there's a lot of kind of hints that you can use about how your brain's performing, uh, performing and a lot of uh, yeah. easy strategies to, to improve it. Mm -hmm. Every architect should be able to do those two basic calculations, right? Uh, same with benchmarking. We give a lot of examples on here of tools specifically built for architects to help them with the benchmarking. Yeah. That's something that should be common practice, right? Mm -hmm. And a really good conversational topic for the team that you're building this building with. So. I love it. So right at the beginning, though, when we talked about design for energy, you said you chose to focus on the uh, aspects of the design that were within the purview of the architect. Yeah. And as a mechanical engineer, I work for architects, and I would like to think that I'm within the purview. <laughs> but it, it does seem to be kind of marginalized right now. The we design it, and then the mechanical engineer does it. Actually, I disagree with myself. <laughs> it's not. But, but is the mechanical design also so let's, let's talk about this for a second, because I yeah. think this is a really important point. So this toolkit is not going to tell you how to design a mechanical system for your building. <laughs> right. But it will tell you that a 
well integrated building, the architect and the mechanical engineer do work together. The design is not complete and then handed off to a mechanical engineer. Here, here, it's not a they baton. Be, it's just <laughs> relay not a baton. race baton. They should be integrated. The architect doesn't need to know how to design a mechanical system, but they do need enough to know enough to understand what performs better than out than others, about how much space is necessary for mechanical rooms. Um, and distribution systems. Distribution systems, a good understanding of thermal comfort. So the purview of architects is not taking the mecha mechanical engineer out of the equation, it's understanding how to work with the mechanical yeah. engineer for desirable outcomes. Well said, okay, good. We had a we had a session a couple of years back called the AE Smackdown. <laughs> where we put a couple mechanical engineers and a couple architects. Oh, no, that sounds great. And it was kind of awkward because, like, oh, uh, no. we, we created, like, a little... Um, Feud? Well, no. uh, yeah, uh, disagreements, you know, professional disagreements. And I think people in the audience were a little bit uh, sort of quiet at first. But at the end of the 60 Minutes, yeah, we just couldn't that. shut them up. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge uh, a brief interruption. We just had Nadav from Building Green stop by. It. Ironic timing. Yeah. Uh, so if there was a little discontinuity here in the theme, yeah, that's what it's from. <laughs> so, but you were talking about this uh, architect engineer smackdown. Oh uh, right, no. And... It was great fun. Um, I think <laughs> you know you, you need to have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, you know. Uh, Architects and engineers tend to think differently, but I think the really interesting part comes in the hybridization of the two. The best architecture isn't just architecture, it's, it's a combination. Yeah, and this gets into the process, you know, when is the feedback. I just want to give one, like, mildly shameless plug for uh, mechanical engineering, which is that <laughs> it, is, it is absolutely my, my heart sings when an architect has said, look, I've left you a lot of space for the mechanical system. And then it sort of crashes the next second when I look at what they've done, and they've given me this one big room, not even central to the building. Yeah. And it's like that's the central plant, right? Like, let's say that's the heart, right? Well, I need the arteries, right? <laughs> I need the veins. So the distribution system, right, where you could say the lungs of the building, mm -hmm. you need to leave room for all that. And it's, when you think about energy, air is heavy, turbulent air generates a lot of friction, so larger than you think, larger than you're probably accustomed to, these distribution systems are absolutely like the where the rubber meets the road on the building. If you constrain air distribution, that building is going to use more energy forever. Uh, and it actually might not be a problem forever, because as Corey says, we're decarbonizing energy, but for a long time, it's going to be a problem. Use as much carbon-free energy as you want. Yeah, I know. I, I think that's awesome. And our society getting off of fuels to technologies. Not really. Don't, don't worry. Really. Um, <laughs> so energy, I, I really think we got to be careful not to get drawn in, because it's a, it's a good one. Let's go on to number seven. Uh, wellness, design for wellness, which wow. is another huge topic and yeah. a very emerging theme in our industry. Exactly. So, I I'm gonna I'm gonna take this a short ways and then hand it over to you, Corey, if that's okay. Sure. Um, there's a ton of research that's just come out. There's uh, the well uh, rating system that's you know less than five years old. Yeah, and Delos is right here in New York. Exactly. They didn't exist five years ago. Yeah. So, um, and it's an entire rating system just dedicated to this topic. So it's obviously really important. What are the main things that we need to get? So, yeah, this is an enormous, this is the reason that buildings exist, Yeah. right? Buildings exist to keep us healthy and comfortable, and it's hard to determine other reasons beyond that. Yeah. So, some yeah. of these topics... <laughs> you can just stop right there. <laughs> some of the topics that the wellness section covers... They're are, healthy, comfortable, and happy years. Yeah, yeah they're, they're age-old, like... Daylighting strategies. Thriving, flourishing, yeah. So, um, yeah, daylighting strategies, thermal comfort strategies, yeah. they've, they've, they've always been around, and then other things are more... Newly emerging. Yeah, yeah. newly emerging. Um, Indoor air quality, uh, light odor, vibration, sound, yeah. yeah. Right, all those fun things. So, yeah, I don't know if we'll get too deep into it, no, but no, just no. on the list of things we cover, food is incredibly important from an energy carbon, but also health standpoint. Um, again, yeah. lighting water quality... Again. Water, water in terms of drinking it and showering air quality, it. Uh, movement and exercise, something like standing desks really took off in the, in the past few years. Um, 
active design strategies, um, views to nature, biophilia, all these things are just fundamental to our existence. And Fascinating. Learn about them here. <laughs> yeah, I think that might be enough. Um, Last piece to touch on yes, is please. health is incredibly important, but we have a section on happiness as well. And <laughs> My goodness. And happiness is a much more objective science than it might seem. There Tell me are that. Well, there are strategies that are known to improve happiness and conditions that are known to um, make people less happy. And the difficult part with happiness is there are so many variables. It's really hard to tease it out. It's really hard to tease it out. Right? How do you know it's like the bad environment that's making you unhappy as opposed to your like, maniacal uh, boss? Right. right. <laughs> but let's track that down. Maybe your boss is maniacal because your boss lives in a poor indoor environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, there's, yeah. and happiness has this viral effect. Mm-hmm. So I That's think... why I like working with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that there's a little bit of a... It's like we've... We've lowered our gaze as a society. We're looking for the next tweet, the next text, the next Instagram. And happiness, you need, you need to raise your gauge and go, where am I going? You know, what's my ultimate goal here? I really think that that's something about So if nothing else, I want us to step back a little bit. We can't technically benchmark happiness the way you can water our energy, but just think about it as a goal. Does yeah. this design strategy, will this improve the happiness of the occupants? Will it de- detract from happiness? Or does it have no impact? And those could be questions we can think about. Yeah. And some of them there are clear answers to, others there are not. But just the conversation, I think, is really valuable. Yeah, I just got kind of a future vision of like a, a real-time functional MRI helmet <laughs> that you can wear. And, and also, I've always wanted like a, a real-time... Um, gas chrom- chromatograph or mass spectrometer <laughs> that can measure air quality but it's miniature and... so technologists out there please we want these things okay so number eight three more is uh, designed for resources another big one yeah and it so much ties into wellness right I, I think um You know, historically, we've been focused on local, regional materials, low VOCs, and recycled content. And now the emphasis is really on materials transparency, what are in our materials, avoiding red list materials, keeping out the toxins that are so, you know, multisyllabic, I can't even remember what they are (laughs) or what they do. I have to go look it up every time. But yeah. we do have a link for that in the toolkit. Excellent. Which is a clue. If yeah. you can't pronounce it, you probably don't want to <laughs> breathe it, eat it, or drink it. Endocrine disrupting, uh, yeah. yeah. EDCs, yeah, flame yeah. retardants. So here we are, immersed in the smell of new carpeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's extra special here today. But that's kind <laughs> of, um, you know, taking these new things and condensing them into, uh, like, a quick reference guide so architects can get a handle on them and start to... Yeah, yeah and it's interestingly, uh, you know, blockchain and this this distributed ledger technology is actually going to be a huge help for tracking embodied carbon and where did this material come from and what's in it. And, and the, the last piece is there are resources for healthy materials and there are different competing databases, or not competing, but there are different databases for specifying healthy materials. Mm-hmm. Um, one example is Declare from the Living Building Challenge, yeah. where... Just a few years ago, when I was working on a Living Building Challenge project, there was something like six materials in the Declare database. And today, there's hundreds. Um, and if you combine that database with other databases like Mindful Materials, Ferris Project, um, mm-hmm. Green Spec, whatever else, there's enough materials listed to design a building. <laughs> and you don't have to do research on every single one of them. Anymore. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a like, what you're doing here is clearly a stepping stone to the future of it's, our it's, It all comes back to time. Mm-hmm. It's, if you can yeah. make two... Um, if there's a decision between two seemingly similar things, and without the information, it's a 50-50, but with the information, one of them is obviously better, you're just going to go towards that one. Yeah. You just need to have the information. And what I've found is, like, no one person can master all of these top ten measures. And so... The process we took with the toolkit was to grab these subject matter experts from all over the industry. You know, Ann Hicks Harney was one, um, Steve Endy from uh, Stephen from Malem, um, really helping us like 
organize our thoughts and condense them. So, I mean, this is really the best minds in the industry kind of putting forth their knowledge to make all architects better. Well said. Okay, last two. Two yeah. more. Design for change, if I have that right. Change is a, it's a relatively um, recent addition to the kind of sustainability purview as well. Fascinating. Um, resilience is often how this comes up, but this is a little bit broader than strictly bouncing back after a okay. disaster. Um, in the previous version of the of the top ten framework, there was a measure called loose, long life loose fit. And the idea was how do you design a building that can serve multiple purposes over a long period of time, especially if the future is uncertain and you don't know what it's going to be. A lot of strategies for that measure incorporated things like, like flexible um, open spaces, maybe a column grid rather than bearing walls, which allowed you to change walls mm -hmm. or... or um, yeah, just wide open, good, good spaces. <laughs> um, but we're looking at a lot of a lot more. So reuse is important. Um, how to take an existing building and retrofit it? Uh, long life, loose fit is still incredibly important. We don't know exactly what the future of work looks like. We don't know what the future of housing looks like. But there are strategies that we can incorporate today to take a pretty good step. An example is. I was just at a session where the state of Georgia is looking at adding a code requirement for the heights of parking garages so that if cars are not as, as popular or self-driving or whatever in the future, um, parking garages can be retrofitted into multifamily or offices or something else. Um, and that would be a great strategy for this field. For this, and uh, I this believe matter. that is happening. The overlap of electrification and oh, information yeah. technology is. But you need You're the a futurist. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to make decisions now that allow us to to adapt in the future. Right. It's future proofing in a way. It's future proofing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the article I shared, the, the last auto mechanic. This idea that the last auto mechanic has already been born. <laughs> oh, it man, was very scary. compelling. compelling we'll, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. It's <laughs> yeah. a really great read. Yeah. Okay, cool. So anything else on design for change? Go to the last one. Uh, yeah, I'd say discovery. Number 10, design for discovery. I think one of the things that is key to discovery is learning from the past, right? And if you're anything like me, you're knee deep in the next project before construction of your last one is finished, right? And it's really hard to go back and, and learn from the past. Uh, so post-occupancy engagement is a really key component. And um, I would say not a lot of people do it. Yeah. Right. Habits for high-performing firms like looked at all these things and uh, sort of benchmarked these high-performing firms against the AIA in general. And I recall like half of the projects done at high-performing firms, 50% got post-occupancy reports. As an average at the AIA, we're looking at less than 20%, right? So if you want to be a high-performing firm, this is the one thing you need to do every single time. Uh, and, and and really at a high level to, to be better. So, well yeah. said. And and it's something that every other profession does. So there's, there's, there's a doctor who I run with occasionally, and we were chatting about post-occupancy. He said that any time a patient comes to him and he's not 100% sure of a diagnosis or, or a treatment, he does a literature review. He said, don't architects do literature reviews? Yeah. It's like, well, we've flip through pretty pictures and magazines <laughs> frequently, but we don't often read studies on outcomes of wall assemblies or or even something less technical than that. We often don't walk to our previous building and ask people how mm -hmm. it's performing, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, how they had to change certain things to make it work better for them. Um, and if you don't do that, you repeat the same mistakes. Yeah, mistakes. Um, yeah I would love to see uh, architects in a residential context spend the night or a few nights in each project they build. <laughs> well, it's so interesting about your talk to the doctor because, like, he'll give a prescription, but then he'll call you back later to see how you're doing, mm -hmm. right? Right. Always. And to not do that is considered malpractice <laughs> in his field. And so, you know, not doing post-occupancy evaluation is 
I think malpractice. Malpractice. <laughs> uh, and then the last piece of that, the post occupancy is kind of the major topic of design for discovery. From the perspective of the architect, we also want to encourage discovery of the occupants as well. So we want them to have a gauging experience. We want, we want them to always learn new things about the space that they're in, experience it in different ways. Um, we have a section in here that we call discovery that influences behavior. Mm -hmm. So how does the occupant take an active role in the performance of the building, um, both for their own personal health, wellness, but also for water and energy conservation. And um, yeah, this, yeah is so, that. this is so important to me as a measure because I think as a profession, we focus too much on the technical aspects of getting it right, and this is one of those behavioral aspects. Yeah. That is so much harder, but so necessary to master. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the, the point there about the occupant, it's profound in terms of it's, it's a ripple that's just going to keep going because the implicit education that occurs when an occupant says, oh, there are these dimensions of quality in a building. I didn't know that. <laughs> right? And then they, because we're a society, we, we love, to, you know, think about, people know more about their iPhone than they do about their home when they buy it. And um, so it's really, it's, it helps societal engagement. So the architect, the, excuse me, the occupant will tell the owner what, what they're interested in, who will feed back to the architect, and you guys are helping prime that virtuous cycle. That's awesome. So there's this article that I read in the New Yorker a while back that was really influential for me when I was thinking about this aspect, um, and it had to do with the design of first class uh, first class seats on long haul air, um, airplanes. Fascinating. And. You might end up in, in on a plane for 10, 12 hours, and the design goal for for these super expensive, super high quality, high class seats was that people, the occupant was supposed to discover something new throughout the entire flight. Whoa. So 12 hours in, you're still discovering something new about your seat. <laughs> and this just blew my mind. It's such a small, compact area. Like, what if we thought about our buildings that way? That the entire lifespan of the building. Uh, how, however long you're living there, 10, 20 years, you could discover something new about the space that keeps you engaged, that keeps you interested, that, that uh, keeps you excited. So maybe we'll link to that article. Yeah, as well. we'll link to that. <laughs> sure totally fun. That. that is awesome. This is and, a resource. And then episode. the last piece <laughs> is from that same article: people who do fly first class, trans, um, trans oceans, often rank that flight as the number one experience of their vacation afterwards. <laughs> Whoa, really? For real. And it's because so much design is put into these experiences. Wow. I, I, just going back very briefly. So you, you mentioned earlier this habits for high-performing firms. Oh, sure. Is that a report? Is that a web, is. website? What is that? Yeah, so um, what happened was Coke puts out a research project every year. And they did one maybe three years ago called Learning from the Leading Edge. And they took 25 years of Code Awards and they condensed them into like a meta-analysis of how they performed over time and found some really interesting patterns amongst the projects. The next one was Habits of High-Performing Firms. And they took firms that had won multiple projects and sort of compared them. What was so wonderful is uh, they hired an intern over the summer to fly out and interview 80 people um, wow. across all these 10 firms. And so they talked from everyone from like the marketing manager to the intern to the principal and got all this feedback on what makes the firm unique and special and uh, how they treat sustainability. It turns out um, the one biggest influencer right, to a high performance firm is its culture, which is also impossible to quantify. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. But there are also other things that made them high performance, right? It's, did they commit to the 2030 challenge? Did they, what percentage of the staff is, uh, you know, diverse? What percentage is male versus female? Uh, how large is the staff? How old is the office? Um, how many are lead APs? You know, it turns out approximately 50% of staff in these higher performing firms have that lead AP. And so, to me, that says, if you want uh, to increase everyone's kind of engagement, involvement, understanding of these issues, like carbon, which is so difficult to kind of wrap your heart and your hands around, they need um, increased exposure. Uh, yeah. 
so you know in that way the lead system is still really really relevant mm -hmm. um, for a broad understanding of all these topics yeah beautiful and lead is going to ally itself or has already begun to with the well standard and then there's other credentials like certified passive house consultant that so are cool. really emerging as uh, important impactful standards yeah I think that was one of the hardest things about writing this report was there's so many different sort of types of architects out there finding one to write it for like a residential architect or a commercial architect it's totally different language right and they, they care about different things we need like four of these reports we need four of them yeah. but then <laughs> at the same time report. we really focus on strategies that are applicable to everyone so every yeah. building will use less energy with a lower lighting power density and every building will make the occupants happier and healthier with better indoor air quality yeah, yeah. So. And it's only taken my whole like 20 year professional career to figure out that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's yours for free. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, and at the risk of bringing this huge feast of ideas to a grinding halt, <laughs> um, I would like to express gratitude to both of you and for, you, for your careers, for your sense of human caring that has you doing this work. Really, that, that, that idea of human caring and multiple dimensions of beauty. Uh, that they are possible. That, that's sort of my summary. That what's happened now is those aspirational goals have now been assisted with a roadmap or a, something of a guide to help you through. It's such an important topic, and thank you. Uh, do you guys have final? Wait, wait. I have one quick question before you do final thoughts. Something we should definitely, you guys should do is um, you two are here on on the episode, but I you mentioned a few people that you use as resources. Uh, you have a team of people behind you? Is, it, is there a specific subgroup that's helped put together the toolkit? Or You mentioned Elena Zambrano. Yeah, we should just list the names of the people who worked on this. Yeah, please. You bet. Uh, so, Ann Hicks Harney from Long Green Specs, uh, Betsy Del Monte from Cameron McAllister Group, David Hincher from Kieran Timberlake, mm. uh, Gunnar Hubbard from Thornton Tomasetti. Oh, Elena Zambrano, Overland Partners. I feel like this is like the Emmys or something. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Emmys, envelope, Over please. the envelope now. <laughs> Marianne Lazarus, also from Cameron McAllister Group. Stephanie Horowitz from Zero Energy Design. Stephen Endy from Malum. Vikram Salmi from Olsen Kundig. Right. And Z Smith from SQ Dumas Report. Z. Yeah. So great, uh, great group. Oh, uh, what a group. We had a call every week for 10 weeks. Yeah. Uh, where we kind of discussed ideas, pulled as much as we could, and, and we got this all together. And I guess the last comment on this resource that'll be linked from the podcast is this is phase one. It's kind of a collection of a lot of ideas, uh, oh, minimal, really? minimally organized, <laughs> but hopefully very useful. Uh -huh. By the end of this year, we're hoping to have phase two, which will be a more edited, polished document with more interactive features. Like pictures? And pictures. <laughs> here, here. Fantastic. Well, it's just been such a wonderful process working with you guys. Uh, and thank you so much for having us on. And it's such a great podcast. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor, really, to share these important ideas. And thank you all for listening, and we'll talk at you next time.